Let's do this. We got a right to sing the blues because they killed the Christians and Jews. Buddhists and Hindus too. The jihad don't discriminate. The jihadis don't hesitate. When they say kill them wherever you find them, they mean you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another exciting episode of This Week in Jihad. I want to thank Billie Holiday, the great singer, for her song, I Got a Right to Sing the Blues, which was the inspiration for this episode's featured poem. The great Billie Holiday, I Got a Right to Sing the Blues. Louis Armstrong also sang it. Frank Sinatra, no doubt many others. You can find the details at your local record dealers. And we have with us tonight the great, the one, the only, Dr. David Wood. David, I got an opening question for you here since this is this week in jihad. Uh, well, 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 first, do you, are you, do you got a brand deal for all the uh, blues you're promoting? A brand you a cut? Do you, deal. Do you get a now cut from any, from any sales? This is the thing. I have never figured out. People think, you know, that this is some sort of a big money-making proposition, and it is unfortunately not. And so if people have, if people want to uh, approach me for sponsorship, for poetry syndicate syndication syndi syndi yeah I'm, I'm i'm getting john fetterman in on this to uh help us out but maybe you can let me know write me at director at jihadwatch.org uh in any case david my opening uh -huh. question yes no, what no. is jihad exactly can you clear that up for us after all these 1400 years we need to have some clarity on this yeah, well, uh, of course, the, the word means uh, struggle. And um, as it's defined by people here in the West, uh, refers to any sort of struggle with anything. Like uh, like if you don't feel like taking a shower and you got to pull a little struggle into it, that's your jihad. You know what I mean? So anything well, can I be a jihad. Well, I'm being a filthy, uh, I'm my, I myself, being a filthy Kaffir, I don't want to take showers. It's part See? of being filthy. See, it's anything, anything you, you have to struggle to do, that's jihad. So everyone's everyone's a jihadi, Robert. We're all jihadis. I'm a right. jihadi. You're a jihadi. Everyone who's watching us is a jihadi because everyone struggles with something. The because jihad chapter is nine, real. Chapter 9, verse 28 says the polytheists are unclean. Mm -hmm. And, of course, everybody is essentially a polytheist if you're not a Muslim. So, obviously, a polytheist... Who, who being unclean would not want to take a shower. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so it would be a kind of jihad. That's yeah, everything. Profound. Everything's a struggle. They say, the, they, they say the struggle is real, but translate that, the jihad is real. The jihad is real. Well, that's just, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful meditation. Oh, babe, by the way. This afternoon, by, yes? Are, are we just going to gloss over the fact that Elon shared one of your recent uh, posts? Yeah, you know, that has been the story of the day, David. Uh, Elon, I, I, had a, I had a story here. Let me actually go to the story. Um, since it is jihad-related, uh, I have it here somewhere. I know. Oh, it's in the women's section. There we go. Here we go. It is this gentleman here. And his name is Milad Salari. Uh, I know I have his picture here. Hang on. There we go. There's Milad. Looks now, like David, someone, Looks like someone beat the crap out of him. Well, yeah. People were saying actually today, amid all the controversy, that he looked just like me. And so I think <laughs> I like that effect right here, where it says Robert Spencer, and there's Milad Salari. Looks like you uh, if you uh, if you, it looks like you if you ate a. Uh... About 400 gallons of hummus. <laughs> and got beat up. <laughs> and got the uh, crap beat out of you. But anyway, Milad Solari is charged with a knife attack against a nine-year-old girl in Gothenburg. Uh, that's in Sweden. He is a migrant from Iran. And the nine-year-old girl was visiting from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, visiting her grandmother in Gothenburg, when suddenly Milad Solari rushed forward, grabbed the girl, and stabbed her several times with a knife. She was stabbed. Where do you think she was stabbed, David? <laughs> hey, 
if if you if you think if you think that's ama an amazing prophecy, Robert, if you think that's an amazing prof prophecy, let me let me make another one. He's just mentally ill, not a jihadi. You are correct, sir. Oh, he is mentally shocker. ill, and he is getting the uh, psychiatric treatment. And not only is he mentally ill, but the woman who called the cops uh, said that the people who were stopping him were mistreating him, which may indicate the reason for his unkempt appearance here. And so he, she was more upset that he was being beaten up, apparently, than about the stabbing of the nine-year-old girl and her grandmother. Milad Solari also stabbed the grandmother. And... Anyway, this is what is disputed. The, uh, although I don't really think it's severely in dispute, uh, it, the Samnit story, Samnit being the Swedish language uh, news site that I got the story from, says, initially there were reports that Milad shouted Allahu Akbar when he stabbed the girl. These are claims that are not included in the police investigation. Now, David, I've been doing Jihad Watch for 20 years online at jihadwatch.org, a full 20 years now. And I've seen literally thousands of stories of this kind in which eyewitnesses say he screamed Allahu Akbar and then it's not in the police report. And I have seen again and again that authorities in places like Sweden and France and Germany and Britain, they don't want to call attention to the Islamic aspect of, such, of stories of this kind. And so when there is a cry of Allahu Akbar or something of that kind, they tend to leave it out of the story. And so I put in my headline for Jihad Watch, Sweden, Muslim migrant on welfare. I thought the welfare was salient because of the jizya, you know, that yeah. the Quran says that the non-Muslims essentially have to pay for the upkeep of the Muslims. Many migrants uh, from Muslim countries go to Europe and they go on welfare because they consider it their due to be paid by the Muslims. Anyway, stabs nine-year-old girl and her grandmother while screaming Allahu Akbar. Didn't even occur to me that he might not have been screaming Allahu Akbar because the police report left that out because that's what the police reports always do. Anyway, the point is Elon commented on this with a single exclamation point and the whole world is blown up. Um, yeah. I've been inundated all day with claims that I'm lying with people pointing out, one, that he's mentally ill, which is in my report because it's in the Samnit News story, and two, that the police left out Allahu Akbar from their report, which is also in my own report because it's in the Samnit News story. And in my report, I also explain how the uh, police always leave that out. So... People are saying what has already been said, what has already been stated in the report. Why do you think that they do that kind of thing, David? Um, yeah, it's a, it, it, I think people realize that not everyone is going to read this stuff. And so th if they can accuse you of misrepresenting something, then they're going to do it. Because uh, it's just the pattern for people who are responding to criticism about jihad their goal usually isn't to refute actual arguments and evidence. Their goal is to discredit the person so that he can be dismissed so that mm -hmm. you just say, ah, don't listen to this guy. He, he misrepresented this. And people go, ah, okay, well, if he's, if he's deceptive, we don't have to listen to him. Even though everything they're complaining about, you can read if they actually uh, click on the post. But uh, a couple things here. Yeah, as far as, I mean, European uh, police are so, have been, so thoroughly emasculated um, by the media and so on that uh, they they would regard it as if you put hey he said Allahu Akbar in a police report you're an Islamophobe right because you're making this uh, you're letting it on that this is about religion and they don't want it to be about religion because that would fly in the face of everything they've been saying for all these years so of course they're going to do it. these are the these are the exact same people who were, I mean. That they're not the exact same people, but they're exact same kind of people who, where their uh, British counterparts spent years and years allowing Pakistani uh, Muslims to rape, drug, gang rape, and pimp 
young British girls because they were so terrified of of acknowledging any sort of connection to religion. They would rather let thousands and thousands of young girls be gang raped and prostituted than to even hint that there might be some connection to Islam. And so it's not going to be much different in, in other places in Europe. So that's one thing, too. I wanted to say to everyone who's worried that he's being mistreated while they were, you know, keeping him from going on his stabbing spree. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is ever, if there is ever a time to smash someone's face in, to beat someone's face in, it's when a guy is stabbing a nine-year-old girl and her grandmother. That would be like, if I were to make a list of when it is appropriate to beat someone's face in, that would be like top of the list. That's top tier stuff. That's top drawer. Uh, that's when you put, that's when you beat someone's face in to stop him from stabbing a nine-year-old girl and her grandmother. And the third thing is, see, I'll, I'll see, I'll see your tweets when you post them. I don't, I don't usually follow like the reactions and how people are responding, but, uh, today I've seen a bunch of their reactions because Elon shared it and so on. And I pointed out that Elon, uh, had shared it. And so I'm, I, yeah, I'm, actually I, I heard it from you. Yeah, I'm seeing all of the I, I'm pointing. I'm seeing all of the responses back and forth, and I kind of got a glimpse into your life, right? It seems like, <laughs> it seems like, <laughs> it seems like your life is basically this. This is a, this is your life in a nutshell. <clears throat> Here's a news story about a jihad attack. Liar! No, this is the story. Here it is. Liar! You're making this up. No, here's the article that I'm quoting. Liar! You, that's not what it says. Actually, it is what it says. It says right here. Liar. And it's just this just back and forth and people calling you liar. Even though you're not lying about anything. Oh, and, and Brevik. 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 Yeah, what about Brevik? What about Anders Brevik? <laughs> Anders Brevik, for those of you who don't know, quoted me repeatedly in his 1300 or whatever it was, 1500 page manifesto. Uh, when he s murdered 77 people in Norway uh, about 12 years ago. And so uh, even though he explicitly says that he was moved to violence by Al-Qaeda and Hamas, the jihadis and Twitter jihadis and, uh, and their enablers and friends, they have all insisted ever since then that I am the inspiration for his terror attack. Uh, the fact that... He quoted me as unfortunate. There's no doubt about it. But Noam Chomsky was praised by Osama bin Laden. And you'll never find uh, anybody throwing o Noam Chomsky, un um Chomsky under the bus because of that. And there was oh. the shooter in Dayton a few years back who was quoting Elizabeth Warren. And she got no trouble for that. So it's all just... Uh, it's it's very self-serving in any case. Well, yes, sir. Oh, it actually, it's completely self-serving. And I can I can only regard anyone who who said, oh, Breivik quoted you for because you you have lots of quotations about what jihad actually teaches. Therefore, he must have been inspired by you. The that is that is either based on complete ignorance or m much more likely outright deception, because mm -hmm. he had a fifteen hundred. He left a fifteen hundred page manifesto, which I read all the relevant portions, except there are things like where you had like recipes of what he was eating mm -hmm. and like it was like his daily schedules and stuff like that. I skipped that stuff. But his actual reasoning process that led him to the attack, it was very interesting. He said that the reason he started to become concerned about Islam and jihad was simply he was living in an area that had Muslims in it and he saw how Muslims were treating non-Muslims. And this started making him wonder why they thought it was okay to treat non-Muslims this way. Then he said he read the Hadith, he said he read Bukhari, and then he saw it all. And so at that point, he decided to get involved in politics so that he could do something about it at a political level. He said he learned very quickly that at the political level and the media level, you would be shouted down as a racist for criticizing anything to do with any of this. And therefore, he concluded that it was that the standard Western practice of when you have a problem or an issue, you bring it to the surface and have public debates on it. That had been that had been made obsolete because you couldn't. They now they would now just call you racist and dismiss everything you're saying. And he said that. Uh, so he decided he would have to get his message across. On, on. And he said, he, as you pointed out, he learned from Al Qaeda that the way to get your message through the media barricade is deadly shock attacks. 
And he concluded all of this by 1999, which was about four years before anyone in the world heard of Robert Spencer, including Anders Breivik. And so look at look at the actual culprits of how this guy decided to launch his terrorist attack. Uh, seeing how Muslims were treating non-Muslims slash reading the Muslim sources and seeing that it justifies this sort of behavior. Politicians and the media who will not allow any open, honest discussion about these issues and Al-Qaeda setting the stage that deadly shock attacks are a way to be heard. Every single thing on his list, we would say, yeah, there are lots of problems there. We do need to discuss all of that. And what do the media do? You see, he quoted Robert Spencer later on when he's trying to make points about jihad. Therefore, it's Spencer's fault. That's it. And Crazy it's really stuff. just a uh, it's it's really it's a it's the old uh, Saul Alinsky tactic, actually. Saul Alinsky, the leftist theorist, says you isolate someone who is influential on the other side, uh, ridicule and cut them off from anybody around them make the support system embarrassed anybody who might express support too embarrassed to do so because then they're in for the same treatment and you just freeze off all of your opponents in this way and it's so it's just the tactic that people unfortunately are still not savvy to although i think they're a lot more aware of it now than they were when the brevik thing first happened and uh, and but notice the parallel when you post a story about jihad, everyone just starts calling you liar and saying you misrepresented something or you, you that you're you're just flat out lying about something, even though you're pointing out, hey, what you just accused me of of leaving out, it's actually in my post. What why why are you saying this and so on? Uh, but notice notice the parallel. It's instead of dealing with your claims about jihad, they think they can just uh, you discredit the person who's making the claims. So you spent your life studying jihad and exposing it. And instead of actually dealing with those claims and exposing them as false, which they can't, they have to discredit you as a person. And so they just link you to Anders Breivik. Oh, Breivik quoted him, you see, that's in, and they completely misrepresent the situation. But uh, guys, it seems to be the pattern with everyone who does not want to deal with reality, just discredit the person who's telling you what the facts are, and therefore you could just avoid the facts like that mm -hmm. until they start, until they show up and start stabbing a nine-year-old girl in the throat. Extremely uh, disturbing and extremely common, David. It's uh, it's true though. You know, I've written twenty-six books, twenty-seven actually, but the twenty-seventh isn't out yet. And most of them have to do with various aspects of Islam and jihad and Sharia. And I've never seen anybody definitively show that anything in any of them is false. All they do is try to convince people that I am too evil to be listened to or make these blanket accusations of lying. And then when I ask for specifics, of course, they never produce any. Well, one way to one way to get through that blockade. See, we don't need we don't need Anders Breivik's uh, uh, sh deadly shock attacks to get information across. Now you got Elon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he can get he can get through he can get through the barrack the the, the media blockade. <clears throat> indeed, so it's uh, interesting times indeed. Anyway, speaking of interesting times, David, Allah has been suspended. Really? How so? Allah, as it turned out, was working for the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office in Massachusetts. He was the director of the office's Community Engagement and Strategic Partnerships Unit. Here he That's... is. There's Allah. Well, you do have all these passages in the Hadiths about Allah, you know, coming down to the, you know, lowest heaven and so on. So, yeah, there yeah. he is, finally. finally. Well, who knew that it was in Suffolk County, Massachusetts? But mm -hmm. anyway, that includes Boston. So uh, this is, this gentleman is actually, his name is True C. Allah, T R U E dash S E E. That's his first name, and his nice. last name is Allah. True C Allah, and he was indeed the uh, director of the the uh, Suffolk County Community Engagement Strategic Partnerships Unit. But as it turned out, oddly enough, it turned out that his name was not the only thing linking him to the Black Nationalist Group, the Nation of Islam. 
which of course is not standard Orthodox Islam, Sunni, or Shiite, or anything else. But it shares the anti-Semitism that comes, that is deeply embedded within Orthodox Sunni and Shiite Islam, within the Quran itself. And it was found that he, has, he had made anti-Semitic comments in the past. And so that's why Allah has been suspended. Uh, but surely this anti-Semitism, it's not really rooted in Orthodox wait, wait, wait. Islam, is it, David? It's, yeah. They respect the people of the book, right? Yeah, I'm confused. You're saying that Allah has made anti-Semitic statements? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Isn't that weird? What are the odds? <laughs> Allah has promoted anti-Semitism. That's... That's Nobody saw it coming. Nobody. <laughs> no one. <laughs> but this is, uh, that was actually in my stupid infidel section because I thought they should have known when they hired a law that he was anti-Semitic, that that just goes with the territory. And so they should not have been surprised when it was discovered that he had made anti-Semitic statements, not in the slightest degree. Mm-mm. I wouldn't have been surprised if you if you told me here's a law, I'll be like, OK, uh, anti-Semitic comments in five, four, <laughs> three, two. What's that? Kill all the Jews. Oh, shocker. Here's a great uh, comment, though, over here. My daughter's obstetrician was Dr. Allah. Luckily, he's a Coptic Christian from Egypt. He told her she needed anything. Call for Allah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I have to say. I have to say, the only good Allah is the is the, is the is the Christians who are named Allah. Yep. Okay, uh, let's see. Shall we do more stupid infidels, David, or jihad attacks? What do you want? Uh, what do you uh, think? That's a coin flip there because those are good topics. Okay, well, I think since this is this week in jihad, we should get to one terrible story, at very least, out of Nigeria. This is another one that I got a lot of heat for today on Twitter with angry people demanding a Nigerian source without realizing that if they had clicked on the link in my tweet, they would have found the Nigerian source. Wait, wait, Nigeria wait, wait, hold up, hold up, hold on. Let me get this, let me get this straight. You <laughs> said, you said something and all they had to do was click on a link, but they're calling you a liar, even mm -hmm. though you, all they have to do is click and that's the source. Yes. And demanding once again, something that was in the story. The story is that Muslims slaughtered 700 Christians as farewell gifts to the outgoing president of Nigeria, Muhammadu Buhari. Now, this has been something that's been represented all day as some grotesque bit of Islamophobia that I devised. But if you go to International Society for Civil Liberties and Rule of Law, which is a Nigerian organization, International Society for Civil Liberties and Rule of Law, often referred to as Intersociety, they published last week a very detailed report. I only uh, put up a little bit of it at Jihad Watch. Very lengthy report. And the headline of the report is Farewell Gifts to Buhari, 700 Christians Slaughtered in May, 1160 Days, and 2,150 in 160 Days of 2023. And the report goes into tremendous detail about uh, the number of Christians killed in various states of Nigeria, Plateau, Kaduna State, uh, various other states, leading to the conclusion that this was done as a gesture of gratitude for Muhammadu Buhari, who has been the president of Nigeria for the last few years, is a member of the Fulani tribe, which is, of course, the same tribe as the... Uh, jihadis, the most bloodthirsty of the jihadis in Nigeria, who are often referred to as Fulani herdsmen in the uh, establishment media whenever they cover it, which is not too often. But tens of thousands, really, of Christians have been killed over the years in Nigeria, and it's picked up since Buhari was president over the last few years. A thousand Christian communities uh, raided, many destroyed by, Juhar, by uh, jihadis, a hundred churches destroyed in the last two months in Nigeria. And so uh, you have explained before why this is, why Nigeria is a flashpoint. And can you remind us of that? Um, yeah, so Islam, Islam will keep expanding until someone stops it from expanding, right? 
Um, so Islam kept expanding until, you know, it gets stopped at the Battle of Tours. It keeps expanding in, you know, until it gets stopped in India or, or wherever. Uh, but once it's stopped, it doesn't say, OK, let's just settle in here forever. It's con it constantly wants to push the line. And so you have these these lines uh, around the entire area that's basically controlled by Islam. And they seem to be willing to do to move that line fast if they can move it quickly or to move it slowly over a period of generations or even centuries. And uh, we, you know, especially in, you know, America and Europe, we think that all that kind of matters is over here when some of the most important places in the world are where those lines are getting pushed uh, because that that gets that gets all the attention uh, from the jihadis. And so one of these places is Nigeria, where you have a uh, Muslim majority in the north, Christian majority in the south, and they want to keep pushing further and further and further until the Christians are wiped out of Nigeria. And then they're just going to keep pushing further and further south uh, in Africa. And so that's that's it's like once the Christians there are wiped out, which is the goal, you can push even further. And the goal is just to, to keep moving and take it all over, take over all of Africa. Indeed. And so another story out of Africa is germane in this context, that in Uganda, there were 42 students killed at a school. Uh, the school was the uh, Lubrira Secondary School in Umpwonde, Umpondwe, Umpondwe town uh, in Uganda, in western Uganda, near the border of Democratic Republic of the Congo. And so we have the jihad that we were discussing in Nigeria that's in West Africa, and then over in Central, shading toward East Africa, in Uganda, we have this other jihad attack. And in this one, Mumbere Bright, who is one of the three students who survived the attack, he says, the rebels immediately shot dead the student who was at the entrance after entering the dormitory. The rebels asked for Muslims among the students, but they were none. There were none. The rebels said they do not kill fellow believers. They slaughtered every student in their sight using pangas, axes, and sharp objects. What's this about not killing fellow believers and asking for the Muslims, David? Yeah, we've heard that before. There, there are some uh, who believe that if you're doing you know, some mass terrorist attack like 9-11 or something like that, that killing other Muslims is collateral damage and that it's acceptable. But in situations like this, we've seen this lots of times before, where you can act, where you actually have an opportunity to distinguish uh, believers from non-believers. We've seen this in the, uh, you remember the uh, Nairobi mall attack and so on, where they'll, they'll sit there asking questions, who's Muslim? And it's interesting if, if you raise your hand and say, I'm a Muslim because you don't want to get killed, they'll ask you to recite something. They'll ask you to recite a prayer or something like that or, or verses from the Quran to make sure that you're a Muslim. Uh, other than that, they're just massacring people. But um, yeah, Muslims, uh, you're not supposed to kill a fellow, deliberately kill a, a fellow Muslim uh, unless he unless he has killed a fellow Muslim and you're, you're responding, uh, you're retaliating. Um, or if he commits adultery, or if he says, I'm no longer a Muslim. Uh, so that's according to Muhammad. Again, uh, they would allow it for mass attacks uh, if, it's, uh, um, if, it's, uh, if, if it's collateral damage. But as far as if you're putting your gun to someone's head, you're supposed to be asking first to see if he's a believer or a non-believer. Indeed. And I should note that that has happened in the United States. Not many people know this, but in 2016... In St. Cloud, Minnesota, at the uh, mall in St. Cloud, St. Cloud, uh, St. Cloud shopping mall called the Crossroads Center, a uh, Muslim named Dahir Adan came up to shoppers and said, asked them if they were Muslim, and if they were, if they were, and of course there are a lot of Muslims in Minnesota, then he let them go, but he would stab the non-Muslims. And it's also happened, as you have pointed out, many other places. I have a long list here with the links on this post at jihadwatch.org. Uh, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mozambique, the Philippines, Mali, uh, Kenya, as you noted, Bangladesh, uh, and uh, I believe that's it. Several taking place in K 
Kenya alone and other countries repeating as well. So this is something we've seen many times. The Quran forbids Muslims to kill other Muslims, but does not forbid them to kill non-Muslims, just the opposite, as a matter of fact. But, but just keep in mind that if the police do not include the Allahu Akbar in the report, never happened, no matter, yes. how, many, no matter how many witnesses saw it. Well, then it's just mental illness, mm -hmm. as, as, as all these things are. It's weird. Sudden jihad syndrome spreading. Yes, indeed. They need, to, of, uh, they, yes. they, need to, they need to invent a medication for that. Yeah, really, there ought to be. Uh, I mean, it's such a common mental illness. There ought to be something they can give to people so that they can function without going on stabbing sprees. But unfortunately, medical science has not evolved to that point yet, David. Now, uh, speaking of mental illness, we have Vladimir Putin, president of the Russian Federation. As it turned out, a gentleman in Volgograd, which of course those in the know know as Stalingrad, the uh, center of a very, very, very pitched battle during World War II, in which the National Socialists were soundly defeated. The gentleman in Volgograd named Nikita Zhurevel burned a Quran. What? Yes. Oh, don't let Putin find out about that. Putin found out. Oh! It's too late, David. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. And he's not happy. Putin has jihadis from Chechnya fighting for him in Ukraine. And, and so by, he, by the way, that, yes. that would prop, that would prop, as far as Putin is concerned, I don't even know a lot about it, but... Uh, the little bit that I know would indicate that would be the extent of his concern. He wants to keep his, his fighters happy. Yeah, that's likely it. Mm -hmm. But what he said was this, that people who burn the Quran in Russia will serve their sentences, as stated by the Minister of Justice, in places of deprivation of liberty, those are known as prisons, located in one of the regions of Russia with a predominantly Muslim population. Now, what do you Whoa. think would be the effect... David. That's a death sentence. That's a death sentence, right? Exactly. Say, so I'm going to put you. I'm going to put you in a in a prison with mostly Muslims for burning. So that's it. Yes, that if he's saying that he's going to send them to Muslim areas, he's saying, I'm, "I want you dead if you burn the Quran." Now, Putin, you know, as you noted, he's just thinking about this in a utilitarian way because he wants to keep the Chechens that he's got fighting for him there he wants to uh keep them happy but at the same time it's also to be noted that the russians putin as well as the patriarch of moscow kirill have cast the war in ukraine as a war against the decadent west and part of the decadence of the west that they identify as the freedom of expression and so it's interesting to note that Putin wants to get rid of the freedom of expression from one side, while the left in the West wants to get rid of it from the other side. And so nobody seems to value it. I don't know how long we're going to be able to do this, David, but we'll enjoy it while we can. It's going to be down to you and me here pretty soon. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Two men against the world. Um, another story out of Nigeria that's interesting that it goes not into the violent jihad, but the uh, stupid infidel section, is uh, this is... Now, I, I want to emphasize, I'm going to name this gentleman from Borno State in Nigeria, a Christian cleric, the Reverend Kalamu Musa Ali Dikwa. And uh, he is not the stupid infidel. The stupid infidels you will see are uh, the Nigerian officials because uh, Reverend Kalamu Musa Ali Dikwa, he says, I was attacked by so-called repentant Boko Haram terrorist members. Yesterday night around 7.30 p.m. after I had left the Church of the Brethren Farm Center. So this is somebody who's saying that he was physically attacked by jihadis who've been, as the parlance is in the West, de-radicalized. Yeah, they probably went through a great de-radicalization program that taught them, hey, the Quran says there's no compulsion in religion. And if anyone kills a man, it's as if he's killed all mankind. By the way, <laughs> please don't look e any of that up. 
or look at any commentaries on it or do the slightest bit of research about it. Just take our word for it and renounce your jihad ways. Yep, that's it. Oh, incidentally, David, that reminds me, in all this kerfuffle on Twitter today, all this hysteria from these people, uh, one guy says, You are a liar, and you are misrepresenting Islam. Islam teaches if one person is killed, it's like you've killed all of humanity. It's Al-Maida 32. So I said, okay, great. Now give us Al-Maida 33, which, mm -hmm. of course, chapter 5, verse 33, the Surat Al-Maida of the Quran says, kill or crucify uh, or amputate the hands and feet on opposite sides of somebody who uh, insults or wages war against Allah and his messenger. And the weird thing was, this is why I'm telling the story, the guy comes back or somebody else, I wasn't paying enough attention to know that it was, uh, whether it was him or somebody else, but anyway, he says, how dare you? I dare you to come say that in front of my face. <laughs> and I thought, what? Say say that the Quran, say Almighty 33 in front of your face? Sure, I'll meet you anywhere, no problem. I don't understand these people, David. It's it's yeah. just yeah, it's crazy. So when when people tell me, ah, the Quran says mm -hmm. if anyone kills a man, uh, it's as if he's killed all mankind. You know, uh, I I usually say, hey, quote the entire verse first, then explain yes. why you left parts of it out because that says that was a teaching of the Jews, and we actually know where that's from. That's from the Talmud, Mishnah Sanhedrin. Um, then quote mm -hmm. Surah. Then quote the very next verse, which calls for massacring people for the for committing the vague crime of spreading mischief or corruption. But it's interesting because guess what, Robert? You're one of the people who spreads mischief and corruption. You're one of the ones who has waged war on Allah and His Messenger by spreading corruption, because they include even criticism of that. That, in fact, when, when Ali Dawa said that that once once they once the Muslims get to power, they're going to kill people like the apostate prophet, he said for spreading corruption in the land. Uh, he, he didn't even have to say, he didn't even have to quote Muhammad saying if anyone leaves his religion, kill him. He just he just said, hey, you're spreading corruption in the land by by uh, by spreading your um, your apostasy. And so this guy, I mean, just just the irony of this all that he's saying, hey, you're wrong about Islam being violent. Look at uh, Surah five, verse thirty two. You say, hey, the very next verse calls for the death of people like me. And he says, oh, yeah, show Come say it to my face so I can kill you. <laughs> yeah. Just as my God commands. How dare you say that Islam promotes violence? I, you're dead, man, if you say that to my face. <laughs> that was probably it. Yeah. This is that nuts, must man. Have been it's it. nuts. Anyway, uh, I asked, I offered to meet him, but he didn't show up. Um, anyway, we have here out of Hamtramck, Michigan. A very interesting story. Hamtramck. Oh, that's like the greatest story of the year right there. So yes, I'm yes, concerned. really. I should have led with this, but there's so much going on this week. Yeah, you can't bury the lead. Yeah, yeah, you're it's right. Well, burying this, the lead. This might it, be the, what, the... Yeah, headline for the for the episode, right? Yeah, the Hamtramck edition or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, this is the story in brief. The City Council of Hamtramck, Michigan, which is near Detroit and Dearborn, is entirely Muslim. It's not just a Muslim majority. Everybody on the city council in Hamtramck is a Muslim. And they have banned the pride flag from city property. So there ain't no pride month in Hamtramck. And so Karen Majewski, who is not a Muslim, who is the former mayor of Hamtramck, she's, David, she's feeling betrayed. Uh huh. I saw after that. All, <laughs> after all that she and her fellow leftists did for the Muslims in Hamtramck, this is the thanks they get. This is the gratitude yeah. that they yeah. get. And they actually did because the pre they they pointed out the previous because the the becoming the Muslim majority mm -hmm. and getting the uh, the complete city council completely Muslim and the mayor all all Muslim. This is a recent development based on based on uh, tons of immigration from uh, Yemen and it was primarily Yemen and one other place, uh, Bangladesh maybe. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, I think, I think so. Bangladesh. Yeah, 
Um, and so this is a recent development before that, before that. So if you go back a couple decades before that, it was like mm -hmm. Polish Christian. It was like Polish Christians. Mm -hmm. And when it was brought before the city council, hey, the Muslims want to blast the call to prayer over the city. Um, the city council said, yes, we're going to allow that as a form of freedom of speech. So they're thinking of things like that. Hey, hey, when we had the majority and we controlled city council, um, Christian, Polish Christians said, yes, you can, we will let these Muslims do their call to prayer, even though there were tons of residents who said, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, have constant, uh, um, an Islamic call to prayer blasting over the city, making all this noise. I don't want to hear that. And city council said, no, we, we, we have to, we have to um, be compassionate and tolerant of our Muslim neighbors and they have the right to do that. So we're going to, we're going to declare that they can blast their call to prayer. And then lo and behold, <laughs> As soon as I get to power, uh, Pride Month gone. Bye, 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 Pride. And now they're all you've betrayed us. So you've got you've got these politicians. These politicians are specifically thinking <clears throat> like the the former the former mayor is just thinking, hey, you've betrayed us, Justin. We went out on a limb for you, and then as soon as you take control, then there's no reciprocity and there's no reciprocity there but then the 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 left in general is going what are you talking about we fought for there were people who said we don't want to bring in more immigrants we fought for you all these times and we spent the past two decades protecting your profit from criticism anytime someone would criticize your profit for being anti-gay and so on, we would call them racists and bigots and islamophobes we've been protecting and shielding you and your community and your profit and your entire religion and your book for decades now and the moment the moment you get any bit any bit of political power we go under the bus yes and we told you for the past two decades that was exactly what's going to happen and you said no we can't trust you you're islamophobes well uh can't 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 say I feel bad for you guys. Here is that former mayor Karen Majewski. You see her sitting there looking sad at the she ingratitude of it all. And uh, Karen Majewski said, um, "Hang on, let me ban a troll here." Karen Majewski said, "Not only there's a sense of betrayal, she also said we supported you when you were threatened, and now our our rights are threatened, and you're the one doing the threatening." Mm -hmm. Who who saw that coming? I don't know. I mean, you'd have you'd have to either be a prophet, or be able to read, or be able to, or be able to pay attention, or have any degree of common sense. It's got to be one of those things because those are the only ways to find it. You got to be able to read. You've got to have eyes to see what's going on in the world, or have some degree of common sense. Any of those will get you to that conclusion. But apart from that, yeah, you wouldn't know. As you noted, the people who Karen Majewski was probably among the leaders of the people in Hamtramck who were saying anybody who would say that this kind of thing could happen is a racist, a bigot, and an Islamophobe. And, uh, well, she just, it's, it's a sad thing, David. She feels betrayed now. And In yeah. fact, in <laughs> fact, I, I mean, we can't prove this because the opportunity has passed, but I personally guarantee you, if we could build a time machine, and we went back to the Polish Christian city council. We said, if you go this route and they get a majority and they take over the local government, here's what they're going to do when Pride Month rolls around. We would have been shouted down as racists and bigots. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, they're all shocked because this, they, they never thought this could have happened. Why? Because they've been basing their view of Islam on what they hear from the media mm -hmm. saying it's, it's the greatest thing since ice cream. Um, and not on anything that has anything to do with actual Islam. Indeed. And they've been listening to all the people who are out there saying that uh, people like me are lying today, when it's actually they who are lying, and now somebody like Karen Majewski is paying the price for the lie without even realizing that she's been lied to. But by the way, isn't it? I mean, it's sad because you don't... You don't... You don't want to see bad things happening and so on, but you do like being proven right about all kinds of things. And we're seeing this over and over and over again. For the past couple decades, Muslims have been saying uh, the, the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. Now they admit that's a lie. Your average Muslim still believes it, but the Dawah guys are now admitting that that was a lie. They were saying uh, that the Quran is filled with all these scientific miracles. We said that's a lie. Just read the passages. These are completely unscientific. 
Um, now, even Ali Dawa has has been coming out saying that this is a lie. Uh, Hamza Tsortsis has acknowledged that this 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 entire argument was completely bogus. Uh, you had the mathematical miracles argument. We said it's complete nonsense. You could you could find these sort of mathematical patterns in any mm -hmm. book. You could find it anywhere if you really look hard enough and start putting them together. Uh, so we said it was a lie. They defended it. Um, then uh, even uh, 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 Sheikh. Uh, um, Sheikh Yasser Qadi had posted a video saying that this is completely bogus, that this is a joke. Uh, and so all of these things that we've been saying for for decades, of course, we've been saying for decades, hey, guys, if you don't watch it, they're going to be promoting child marriage. We're called liars. Ah, bigots, racists, Islamophobes. Islam will never do this. Now, now it's become like everyone's saying it. Muhammad Hijab says, if you just go with the Quran, you'll conclude that you can have sex with a five-year-old. Ali Dawa says that if his daughter gets menstruation at the age of nine, he'll tell her she's ready to be married. Daniel Hakikachu says, as long as you get parental consent, you could marry an 11-month-old baby who gets precocious puberty. Absolutely disgusting. And, and they're defending it almost across the board now. Everything we said 10 years ago, they're now acknowledging is completely true, even though we were called liars for saying it. And it's the same thing with uh, all these poli political issues and the breakdown of the LGBTQ um, alliance with Islam. It's like we're right. Every guys. Do the math here because they're still saying that people like Robert are lying. Right. You could go what, look at anything he posts. Let's say you're a liar. It should be a simple response. Hey, everything I said 10 years ago, you said I was lying is now has now proven right. What are the odds that I'm lying about this and that you're not? Excellent question. Here's another one I'll bet that uh, we're going to get start seeing justifications about, and that's beating your wife. Mm. Uh, here we have a very interesting story out of France. A uh, Syrian migrant to France named Louis Alali. He uh, moved with his wife, Iman, into France, and then he gave her a couple of black eyes. And he hit her with sticks, he hit her with a belt, and she actually made, did an unusual thing, David. She went to the cops. Whoa, now, this not, is even, not, yeah. even, not, even, not even supposed to do that. They'll tell you in the mm -hmm. Muslim community, don't do that. You go, if you have a problem, you go to your local Sharia council, where they'll, of course, condemn you for being a bad wife. Indeed. And so... In the first place, it's extremely unusual. And she immediately regretted it. Who knows if she was threatened or something, but she's been trying to withdraw her complaints. Only the trial is now going on. And uh, she says, my husband, I love him and I want him out of prison. And it's, I think I, I, can, I can just imagine what she's facing. She's looking at threats. She's looking at ostracism. Any number of any any kind of pressure is being put on her, and so it's no wonder that she wants to withdraw the complaints. But what's interesting is that the lawyer for her husband is saying this that he is a victim. We've never heard that before. He is a victim of a significant cultural gap between Syria and France. Now, what's the cultural gap exactly, David? Uh, one is Islamic and one isn't. I believe you're right. Now, why would that make a difference? Because uh, one says you can beat your wife until her skin turns green, and the other says, no, that's illegal. So there you go. So he is uh, the victim of this cultural gap. He came to France. He figured he could beat his wife like he would in Syria. And he can't. And so the poor fellow, he's a victim, but he is in no mood to conciliate. He said, I no longer wish to live with my wife. She brings me too many problems. So what can he do now? Uh, well, he could just divorce her pretty quick, like. Yep. All he has to do is say, you were divorced, and boom. And she's then divorced. she's a... And then she, of course, will be an outcast in the Islamic community for uh, shaming the community and her husband like that and actually thinking that she has any sort of right in France not to be treated like her husband's personal punching bag. You know, you know, Robert, some some men give their wives gifts of chocolates and flowers and jewelry. Others give their wives the gifts of black eyes and bruises. Indeed. And so uh, if he divorces her three times, if he says you were divorced, 
he can just take her back because all he has to do is say, you're divorced and she's divorced. But if he gets over being angry the next day and says, hey, forget it, never mind, then she's not divorced. But if he does that three times, then what? Then she, if he wants her back, she has to go have sex with another man. <laughs> and where did you get... That must be some extremist idea, right? It's a no. hijacking of Islam, right? No, that's Muhammad. <laughs> Yep, right in the you Quran, gotta, ladies and gentlemen. You can't, you can't, you can't have, you can't have your wife back until she goes and has sex with someone else. Chapter two, verses two hundred twenty-eight to two thirty. All right, so uh, we have several women's rights stories of the same kind. There was a big story actually out of Greece, and this is Anastasia. Let me. I thought I. Oh, here we go. That is a young lady. Uh, named Anastasia Patricia Rubinska, a Polish girl who went to Greece and uh, was now there are a couple of migrants from Pakistan and Bangladesh who are being held for her murder. Uh, and apparently they said they just had sex with her and then she was found dead later, but they are suspected of killing her. Now, uh, surely they wouldn't treat a woman so cavalierly and cruelly and violently as that, would they, David? There's no justification for that sort of thing, is there? Uh, no, no justification for uh, capturing women and raping them. Oh, except it's all over the place in the Muslim sources. Yes, unfortunately, this kind of behavior is allowed for non-Muslims. It doesn't say, of course, you can kill her. But the value of, of the life of a non-Muslim woman is so low that it is of little moment to them. It's worth noting that actually in Islamic law, there are very specific instructions given for the value of a life. And if you kill someone, you can, instead of serving a prison sentence, you can pay a certain amount of money to the relatives. But it's a higher amount for Muslims than it is for non-Muslims. And they're actually in the sources, there are gradations that you pay this amount if it's a Hindu, this amount if it's a Christian, this amount if it's a Jew, this amount if it's all if, if, if all these are, are women. And so in a Islamic law, in other words, the value of the life of a non-Muslim and of a woman is actually explicitly less than the value of the life of a Muslim. Well, the non-Muslims are, as the Quran says, the worst of creatures, so. There you go. So the worst of creatures, their lives are just not as valuable as the lives of Muslims. This is Adil Mutlag. And Adil Mutlag is also a Muslim migrant in Sweden, in Motala, and he has just been sentenced to life in prison because Adil Mutlag is 53 and his 29-year-old wife was found dead with 30 stab wounds. And as it turned out, he killed her in front of their children. They had two sons, ages 5 and 8. And he murdered her in front of them because... The 29-year-old wife said that she wanted to divorce him. Now, why couldn't she just say you were divorced and then that would be it, David? Isn't that how it works? Yeah, yeah, sure it is. In fantasy land. Indeed. A man can divorce a woman with a word, but in Islam, a woman cannot divorce a man unless... She goes before the Sharia court, makes a case, and the Sharia court approves it, which is a very arduous and lengthy and difficult process that also involves a great deal of social opprobrium. And so most women never attempt it. All right, let's see. We have a few minutes here. A couple of other stories. We have uh, several out of the United States, as a matter of fact. Um, let me get this guy here. I know I saved his picture. This is Cole James Bridges. And you can see that he is an American. He is from Stowe, Ohio. 
And a few years back, he converted to Islam and also joined the army. We don't know if he joined the army as a Muslim or not, but of course the army would not have refused to take him as a Muslim. They would have been thrilled to get him as a Muslim. And then, as it turned out, he attempted to contact an ISIS jihadi while in the army, while an army private, while working in Fort Stewart in Georgia as a cavalry scout. And uh, I didn't know they still had cavalry scouts. Do they go in front of the horses? I mean, anyway, I don't know. But in, in any case, he has pleaded guilty this past week to trying to aid ISIS to kill American soldiers. Now, this guy's a convert to Islam from Ohio, David. He used to work at Papa John's Pizza. And uh, if he converted to Islam, surely he must have been taught the peaceful Islam that is the true teaching of the Quran. Am I right? Uh, yeah, unless he actually talked to some people who know what they're talking about mm -hmm. or read the Muslim sources for himself. If he actually read the Muslim sources for himself or talked about someone who had any clue what they're talking about, uh, we've already mentioned, we've already mentioned Surah 5, verse 33, that says the penalty for causing mischief in a Muslim land is death. Now, Robert, has the, not according to us, according to Islam, has the U.S. military caused mischief in Muslim lands? Oh, very much so, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and so, on a large scale, a massive industrial scale. And so people are under a death sentence, and the U.S. is continuing to do it. The U.S. continues to make mischief in Muslim lands, and therefore they are under a death sentence. That military is under a death sentence where possible. So a guy converts to Islam, everyone celebrates, yay, we have a Muslim in our army, and meanwhile he's contacting ISIS. Uh, how, how, what do you want me to do? How should I kill these guys for causing mischief in our lands, as the Quran commands? Indeed. Out of Oregon... We have a uh, migrant from Iraq who came to Oregon from Iraq in 2014, Hawazen Samir Mothafar, and he has pleaded guilty this week also to providing material support to ISIS. As it turns out, he was running the, uh, he was in contact with the Islamic State's media wing and founded an entire media organization there in Oregon to aid ISIS. Uh, do you think that when they let him in from Iraq in 2014, that any attempt was made to determine if he had jihadi sentiments? Uh, no, I seriously doubt it. But ha have you noticed that's a pattern? You've got all these people who are coming in from all these other different places and uh, they think it's OK to uh, kill people, beat their wives, kill their wives, strangle their wives, <laughs> stab their wives, kill unbelievers, slaughter unbelievers, um, rape people, rape captives. And it never crosses anyone's mind to say, hey, uh, could you tell us what you believe before before we let you in? It's just it's just assumed because it's it's all we hear that uh, everyone is a freedom loving, peace loving, human rights loving uh, person in the Muslim world. And so you could just bring in as many as possible and nothing's going to go wrong. Indeed. Uh, Islamophobia story out of Indiana. At least I think it's an Islamophobia story. This is uh, Sierra Justice Malloy is her name. Uh, as far as I know, it is a her. And I'm not one of those people who uh, does the trendy pronoun thing. If she's a female, I call her her. Anyway, um, she has been uh, placed under arrest after uh, reports of arson outside a cable store and she was burning an American flag and the cops came up and she threatened to behead them and expressed support for ISIS. I suspect that this individual was just kind of nuts uh, and that's based on the uh, dialogue that she had with the cops which you can find at the Jihad Watch site but the thing is where would she get the idea that beheading would have anything to do if she really were a convert to Islam? Uh, surely beheading is not something that's involved in that. No, of course not. Peace and tolerance. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yes, well, there is 47.4, of course, chapter 47, verse 4 of the Quran. When you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks. And so that's where Sierra Justice Malloy got that idea 
uh, or something derived from that. But in any case, uh, this incidence of Islamophobia has been duly nipped in the bud by the police. All she did was burn a flag, not anything else. Um, oh, she also had an ISIS flag with her, which is interesting. I don't know where you get one of those in Indiana. Maybe Walmart. Anyway, uh, this has been an exciting hour, another thrilling episode of the award-winning program this week in Jihad. I'll be back on the road again next couple weeks, so uh, giving speeches maybe in your town, but probably not with a good enough hotel connection for this, but we'll see about it. In any case, we hope to be back later with more Jihad. We hope there's no more Jihad, but if there is, we hope to be back later. And in the meantime, may God bless you all and stay safe.